All right, hey you guys. This is my effort to connect a little differently each week. Um, so I'm doing two things. In addition to Sunday morning service together over Zoom or on, on live somehow, I'm also delivering the message, the main, the main content of what I'm going to be speaking on on Sunday. I'm delivering it this way so that those of you who don't have a chance to join us on Sunday morning can listen to this any time during the week that you want to. So today I chose to come back to our fellowship hall and uh, it is just so cool to be here and very strange that you are not here, but take a look. Aw, home. <laughs> I know you guys miss it, I miss it too. I miss our time together here. For sure, uh, just time together in the same space is uh, would be awesome. So how are you guys doing? You hanging in there? <laughs> you hanging in there this week? It's been a lot. It's been another big week um, all around all around us. It's been big, um, and so we we gather each week as a ritual um, at, to remind us of who we are and whose we are, and that we're connected and that we belong. In far and wide, physically, distance or not, we are connected in the spirit. And that gives us comfort and hope and also allows energies to flow that help encourage, lift us up and bring us hope. So this indeed is a day that the Lord has made. <laughs> you know, it's about three o'clock on Friday afternoon that I'm recording this message. And sometimes, once a year, we call this time of day Good Friday. It was just a regular Friday afternoon at three o'clock that Jesus died. And we call that Good, Good Friday. But I was so connected to that point as, as I was studying for this message. There are just these ordinary times of day that extraordinary things happen. And if we're not aware and awake, we miss it. And that is the invitation to us all this during these times of unprecedented schedules and chaos and time that we wake up, stay open, and see God in the ordinary spaces. And I am so honored to speak with so many of you and, and others that um, just to be in the community with so many people, with um, having different dialogues, questions, conversations that come up. Where is God? Where is God? I'm not even sure, some would say, I'm not even sure I believe in God anymore. If God were real, why is he allowing all of this to happen? And those are questions that are so valid and so good. And I, I'm really almost moved to tears when I think about having these conversations with people because it's just so real. It's so real to have doubts, to have fears. It is human. You are alive, you are awake. To one troubled soul, I said, God is here. You've got to look smaller. You've got to look closer. You've got to look at the ordinary. You've got to. If you don't, you will miss it because God is not coming into the stage of this world in big right-handed judge, judgment type ways. He's not. He doesn't often, God does not often come overtly or explicitly. God comes quietly, gently. It's in the inhale and the exhale. That's as close as we can get it. He's as close as the air we breathe. And to do that, that intentional breathing, knowing that that is spirit, that is your spirit. When that breath is taken, you are no longer here. That is an indication you have spirit alive within you. And all throughout the ages of religions, we want to look over here, look over there. Did God do the right thing with that? We're constantly, don't you think we're constantly judging God? <laughs> sure we are. 
sure we are. We're constantly judging God and calling God on the carpet. <laughs> mm hmm. Calling God on the carpet. When? When? Why? How? What were you? Why didn't you? We've been calling God on the carpet for centuries. And God shows up. Yeah, he does. Absolutely he does. Yeah. And I am using, I, I will endeavor to use some different pronouns with regard to God. Listen, you have to have language to start somewhere. You just have to have language to describe the, the ineffable. <laughs> you have to. Our text today is really hard, so I want to get into it. Um, I could talk to you all day long about all the things, so I, I will try to just stick to this message. I decided to preach behind uh, the old pulpit here at the church. Um, I haven't, I haven't delivered a message behind the pulpit in seven months, so you can't see it, but I'm like holding my hands on the corners like I used to do. Um, I won't be able to walk around and go into the front and go to the front rows like I like to do because there's no one here to make the camera follow me. So, <laughs> so the thing about Jesus and his teachings, a lot of people like to say, I am a follower of Jesus, I obey his teachings, I am in agreement with, with what Jesus says and what is written that he said, but all of the other things or apostles or epistles or prophets, I can do without, but Jesus, I'm a follower of Jesus. And then regarding God, I don't, you know, on and on the, the conversation can go. But I'm always curious about what exactly, what exactly the teachings of Jesus are you most agreeable to? The parables, for one, are very difficult to understand. They are confusing. They are complex. They are opaque. The straightforward teachings aren't much better. <laughs> Jesus is found saying so many hard things that I'm curious if anybody has actually referenced the words that we have written that Jesus said in a very long time because it's such sort of this pop culture thing to say, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus, yes. What, what do we, <laughs> what do we think Jesus says, you know, and have we looked at it in a while? And so if you're curious to know where to find the words of Jesus, it is in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In most of the Bibles that are printed out, they are in red. The words of Jesus are in red. Um, there are other things that Jesus said that are not recorded in our canonized version of the Protestant scriptures. We can talk about that another time. But today, our reading is the parable of the wedding feast. Um, it's one of the most difficult. And I don't hear a lot of progressive liberal, <laughs> I don't even know how to label it. Once you start saying labels, it is just not okay, right? I mean, because then all of a sudden somebody's out of that. Somebody's out of that um, category. So as we speak with these words of wisdom and the gospel, we have to be so careful that we are speaking this sort of uh, open, open and inclusive language. So even when I just said progressive and liberal to some, that feels uh, awesome. And to others, that's like, wait a minute. <laughs> what about me? I am here for you. I am here for you. Everything, all the lists, the list of everything and everywhere that you fall from the left to the right, to the up, to the down, to the end, to the out. Sometimes language so small makes things so small. So please hear my heart. I don't hear this, ma this passage preached a lot, and the time, especially recently, but in my past, 
um, if it was mentioned, it was uh, to, to um, cause fear and to bring fear. And once I read it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about from Matthew 22. So let's jump right in. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out another, other servants and saying, Telling, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his own business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroying those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw one man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. The man, the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. The word of the Lord. <laughs> Praise be to God. I spoke this parable to my wife. Um, I did not read it to her line by line, and I gave her the gist of the story. And she was pretty intrigued and listening as I spoke it. And then when I got to the part about the king binding the one guy who was dressed in appropriate hand and foot, carrying him out to outer darkness and um, leaving him there, <laughs> she's like, oh, give me a break. Right. I mean, I think most of us would say that even now approached with this text. It's difficult because so many of us have come, come forward in our understanding of God as being universally good and universally um, good to all and that all good and bad are welcome. We don't tend to like to think of God or this king in the story as someone who is, everything is going well, but they're going to point out the one thing that isn't. Why does he do that? So parables are, are stories that are meant to be, literally the word means to cast alongside. So to, to, to put something into language or a story that's trying to explain something bigger or, or um, something bigger, yeah. It's trying to explain something that, that's hard to explain. So Jesus starts the parable off, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. Well, that is really interesting. Um, we have so many jumping off points, but what is the kingdom of heaven like? So you're telling me that the kingdom of heaven is like, okay, people get invited, and then the people that say no get killed. <laughs> and then the people that, that, uh, that say yes, come, but then if you're not dressed right and you don't have the right outfit, you also will be carried out and bound. So Bonnie, what are you going to do with this? How are you possibly going to make any sense of this? And well, I mean, frankly, I've been wrestling with this text for five days. I read it on Monday. I, well, more than that, I've wrestled, wrestled with it for 35 years. You've probably heard this preached from a pulpit that meant to make you feel like you weren't putting God first, that your priorities of land or family or business um, if those things came before God, that you were somehow dishonoring God. You've also probably been made to feel like you were 
um, that God's final judgment could possibly include you being thrown into um, an eternal darkness, an outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you've probably been made to feel that many are called but few are chosen and you would just hope and beg and pray that you were one of the chosen ones. I hope that I can bring some salve to those terrible and, dare I say, evil ways of interpreting this text. The, the wedding garment is a thing. It's a big deal. And feasts and weddings are often in Jewish narratives um, for us to, to behold. I mean, you got the wedding at Cana. You've got quite a, quite a few places where there's a banquet or a reception or a supper. Um, there's a, the, the final supper of the Lamb in Revelation that's, that's mentioned, the marriage feast of Cana, the last supper, the evening meal at Emmaus, uh, even the breakfast, the, the breakfast of royal fish by the lakeside um, at, at one of Jesus' resurrection appearances, and the Passover meal, even. So meals and weddings are often a picture that is used to describe God and people and the party and where the party is. And so this story kind of takes us on a road because we don't want to see violence. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to read violence in black and white in the text, especially if everything is human, directed at human, or coming from a human. But, but friends, you should know that, that this text, our, our scriptures are filled with violence, filled with killing. And we have to make sense of that for, for us today. And then because it is parable, because it is story, we have to look at the nuance. And that is, you know, Jesus didn't even ask before he shared these parables if they were well-developed or mature, <laughs> mature people enough to understand nuance. He just put it out there. Jesus feels really ungodly in this text. <laughs> Can we grapple with a God who appears on the surface to be so ungodly? I mean, I preach a message of love and hope. That's primarily what I preach. I am a love is patient, love is kind, la da 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 da. Well, love was not, God was not, and if love is God and God was supposed to be being patient and kind, there is not a lot of patience or kindness shown in this text. The invitation is good. I, I like that everybody's invited. One thing to note on the invitation is that the invitation, whoever the invitation was given to, which eventually is all people, in this text, the invitation by itself made the people worthy and made the people accepted. The part that it says, it was not, it, so, so let me just stay on that for a second. The invitation itself made the people worthy. Whoever, to whomever the invitation was given, that person was worthy. The the part that it says they were not they were not worthy i mean the, the text really just means that they they did not show up they did not count, they did not regard this invitation they did not take it seriously they did not um want to honor the king or be a part of the party they really refused the party and the others as it goes on um you know finally finally show up and then god does another ungodly thing here in this text, God decides in, in it, it, that everyone is welcome, that all of the people dressed rightly, wrongly, class differences, all the ways in which most people would not want the people that the king was inviting to actually be at the party. I mean, have you ever been embarrassed? <laughs> have you ever been embarrassed of someone that you might really appreciate behind closed doors but in public you're come on come on if you were here in the house i know you'd be laughing you'd be laughing right now and you'd be going I, you'd be saying come on tell the truth have you ever been like yeah they're my friends uh when i <laughs> 
they're my friend when I really need somebody, but hey, I don't want to be seen, you know, in public with them. I don't want to go to that dinner with them. They don't know how to, they don't know how to do that kind of dinner. They don't know how to do that. They don't even have the right clothes for that. <laughs> Aren't we all so funny? Whew, come on. Anybody that's too pious to admit that, you're just too pious for God. I don't even know what, what that means. Um, so, <laughs> I'm having fun with this. So yeah, God does another ungodly thing and invites people that don't actually make his party look any better. They actually make it look worse. And in that day, it was the responsibility of the king um, at a royal wedding to provide wedding garments to everybody who was invited. That was just the way it was. They provided all of the garments. And so uh, to come in, to not be on the wedding, to not, I mean, get this, you're not on the invitation list anyway. This is sort of a plan B. Now you are invited, but one guy refuses to put on, <laughs> refuses to put on the garment, the, the proper attire. I mean, it's just, it's hysterical. And so there are no really good excuses, but I think this is really funny because, you know, maybe that guy is thinking, hey, I want to be recognized for myself, not just accepted because somebody put a monkey suit on me. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? Have you ever been the one to say that? Hey, I don't want to conform. I want to stand out. And if they don't like it, then I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. And so God does this sort of ungodly thing and, and accepts people that don't make his party look any better. And he really levels the playing field by putting on this robe. Now, there's a lot of uh, things in this. You know, immediately all of my Bible people are going, okay, this is the robe of righteousness. This is Christ. This is, you're being clothed in Christ Jesus clothed in Christ. Yes, all of, all of that is true. Because at, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the only divinely acceptable quality is trust and faith. That's the only divinely acceptable quality. Now, for years when I've read this parable, I always thought that that one guy that was thrown out was probably like the one guy that was under the bridge and, I don't know, was drinking wine by nine o'clock in the morning and really uh, it, it probably smelling bad and looking bad. But there's another way to look at that one individual. That one individual could have been the most, most well-dressed there. Maybe, maybe that guy was dressed the best, and you know, maybe showing off his, his status, because that's what they were doing then, the, how they dressed and what they, the way that they did their hair and did their face, did their, their clothes, it indicated their class. So what if this guy was so impressed with himself and his, his status? I mean, what if he was part of the original invitation group and decided at, and, and you know, missed the whole SWAT team <laughs> going out there? You know, maybe he missed getting his stuff being destroyed. But, it, but it's like, hey, if he thinks I'm gonna put on an unfitted tuxedo and hobnob with all those deadbeats, he's got another thing coming, right? I mean, so he wants to sort of stay in his class because he was sort of the first one and now he's with all these other people that aren't, that like they needed a wedding garment. This guy didn't feel like he needed a wedding garment. You see where I'm, where I'm with, it. you see how to, I think what's happened in the past, how I'm wrestling with this text, What's happened with so many preachers and, and churches is they come, they come at us with this, hey, I know the answers to all of these hard problems. The answer is very black and white, la, la, la. But in reality, the, the fun stuff is actually in the wrestling with the complexity. Wrestling with this Jesus, with this God. Wrestling with these words wrestling with the vacancy seemingly or wrestling with the now i mean instead of a, a left-handed kind of judgment uh, more of 
more opaque, more implicit. I mean, there's just this like ferocious ferocity. <laughs> it's just like almost over the top. It's exaggerated. It's like a, it's more than what's needed for the for the for the experience. The interesting thing is nobody. Well, I won't say that. We want there to be a hell. Generally, as a humanity, we want there to be the hell because somebody has to pay. And it is too hard to accept a grace and a gift freely given. It is too hard to do that. It's too hard to stay at the party. Because what if your no good neighbor or your no good cousin also gets the same advantage, the same invite, the same grace given to him? What does that mean about you? If you didn't earn it on your hard-earned money, if you didn't earn it by the things that you do on a daily basis that would make you more holy than somebody else or more worthy, then what do you have? If, here, here's the deal. If you have to have a help, would you go here? That nobody is actually kicked out who wasn't already in. Hell may be an option, but if it is, it is one that is given to us only after we have already received the entirely non-optional gift of sitting together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And even for those in hell, God never withdraws that gift because as Paul says in Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. If you have to have a hell, know that you were already invited and you were already in and you were already seated and your lack of acceptance, of accepting your acceptance is the only thing that puts you in that state of mind, that state of hell. <laughs> Put all that together and there's so much more. And you get the picture. We, like the guests, may cease to care about our acceptance, but God never has a change of heart about having offered us acceptance in the first place. Accordingly, while this parable certainly says that God, like the king, will tell those who refuse to trust him to go to hell, hell nevertheless remains radically unnecessary. There will never be any reasons from God's point of view for anyone to end up there. <laughs> there will never be any reasons it is actually the quote-unquote sinner that God draws closer to and invites deeper in. It is the one who insists upon their own rights and ego and pride. There's other places in the Bible that says God, that there's this resistance to those who resist. I know that there's some other things. That, yeah. Listen, you can't cover yourself. None of us can. So the covering is in Christ. It is in the free gift. But it feels too good. It feels like there's a catch. And it feels like someone has to be on the outside. And that brings me all the way back to Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock. Jesus became the one who was on the outside. Jesus did it. Jesus paid it. Jesus took it all the injustice the betrayal the violence the reputation the loss of reputation jesus took the lies jesus took the physical the physical problems and ailments jesus did, jesus did that one friday afternoon at three o'clock and to put our faith and trust only in that is the only acceptable outfit that any of us can put on in any scenario of our lives.
There's so much more we could have gone into on this. I hope that some of these nuggets, as you were listening to them in your ears, I hope that something clicked for you, that something was, something was like a coin being dropped into a piggy bank, that it just made sense. These parables are hard. So don't faint and don't give up when you come across something in the Bible. If you're reading and it doesn't seem to make sense or line up with what you think God to be, or it seems so ungodly of God, because there's this ungodliness of extravagant grace and there's ungodliness of strict judgment. And we want to pin God to either side and say somehow this doesn't make sense and somehow this is unfair or unjust. I have a feeling that during all of this, if we would take a chance and take an, a, a moment to look a little deeper, listen a little sweeter, a little softer, we would see the beautiful working of grace in all of the things we really don't understand. And that's why I think this parable was perfect for a time like this in which we're living, that it's hard to understand. I know you want me to draw a summary and a conclusion but I want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus today. I want to leave it a little vague. I want to leave you thinking. I want you to return to the master, the Jesus, the one, the spirit within you and ask the hard questions. Because God is there and God is with us. I hope you've enjoyed this. I've enjoyed, I, I've had a good time doing it and also having a good time being in the house again here um here with with you i'll give you another shot of the house <laughs> one day we will either be back here or we will be somewhere together um, loving each other gathering together doing our rituals of faith so join me sunday morning if you can um for for more of this and then of course all of our rituals that we love to come back to um, I love you guys. See you next time.